Happy Wisdom Wednesday, everyone, and this week's book of the week is God's Debris, A Thought Experiment by Scott Adams. Now, I'm coming to you, obviously not from the Bay Area, but from beautiful Aspen, which I have this wonderful, fantastic view behind me. And, you know, this is the time of year that I usually like to take some time to to really think, think about big things, think about life, uh, not just necessarily my career. And so I heard about this book, and obviously I'm a big fan of Scott Adams' work, but this is his first fiction non-Dilbert focused book and when I read about this book the way it was described is that you should read this book if you like having the your brain spun around inside your skull now it's a thought experiment in that Scott Adams provides a very interesting scenario and the scenario is this the character meets an old man who seems to know everything about the world he's able to explain quantum physics religion life the universe in very simple novel terms almost like he was God. So what does that feel like to suddenly understand everything and in such a simple way? So looking at this book, I knew that I had to kind of review it and especially do it at the end of the year, given that 2020 has been quite uh, quite an interesting year. And I'll tell you what, I will warn you about this book before I review it, that there's going to be a few spoilers in this review. Plus, if you have trouble sleeping at night, don't read this book because I promise you, not only will it make your brain spin around in your skull, you will be up for days thinking about what you just read in this very thin book. Now, let's go inside where it's a little bit more warmer and let me tell you a little bit more about it. Now, if you're familiar with this concept called Occam's Razor, which is the simplest explanation is usually right, we often look for this in the world to explain the most complex things in life. and. Oftentimes we go to the simplest explanation because between two uh, things that explain how something works, between a very complicated one and a simple one, the simple one just seems to be a lot more convenient and thus more persuasive. And this is the crux of what God's debris is about. Because as the character meets this older man who starts to break down all these big aspects of the world, life, the universe, it becomes so simple and novel and persuasive, right, that that in itself lies the problem. Right? It's too simple. Now, as this old man starts speaking to, this, uh, to the main character and explaining things such as the aliens and the universe, there's some key lessons that I really enjoyed and I want to share with you. So one of them is the old man pointed out a flaw in this young man's thinking, which is that one of his questions reveals his bias for a binary world where everything is either real or imaginary. And that distinction lies in his perceptions, not in the universe. And so his inability to see other possibilities and the lack of vocabulary are the limits of the brain, not the universes. And so something to consider is if we look at, let's say, insects, there's sometimes a bug, let's say a bee on the wall, and you can wave your hand, and sometimes the bee isn't even aware of it. If a bee is in the, in the house and the TV is on, does a bee even know that that's a TV? Probably not, because the bee lacks a certain sense of a certain uh, uh, sensory that allows it to comprehend what that is. Well, in a way, human beings are just like that bee. So, are there things in this world that we just lack the senses? Things that are more complicated that really explain how the universe works, and because our brain lacks the vocabulary, the perception, the ability to interpret those things. That's probably why we end up going towards the simplest explanation. Another really interesting thing here is, in a way, Scott Adams sort of predicted a really uh, sophisticated concept, which is this idea of a universal mind. If we think about how Twitter works, Twitter is a compilation of millions of minds, and when ideas are thrown out into the Twitterverse, those minds kind of get together in hive mind and essentially influence the, those ideas. So in this book, which was written almost two decades ago, Scott says that society's intelligence is merging over the internet, creating, in effect, a global mind that can do vastly more than any individual mind. Eventually, everything that is known by one person will be available to all. A decision can be made by the collective mind of humanity and instantly communicated to the body of society. And again, this is two decades ago in 2001, and so Scott was able to predict the effect of social media engines. This is way before Facebook became even popular, which it launched, I believe, in 2004, three years later. But Scott was able to perceive this. And by the way, if you haven't followed Scott lately, he seems to be incredibly spot on when it comes to predicting unbelievable things. 
Now, another interesting lesson from this book is this idea that human beings are human beings regardless whether they're politicians or scientists. This is something that Scott's really focused on lately because during COVID-19, there's been a clash of people saying you should follow the science and then people who are supposedly not following the science, right? And in reality, Scott writes in this book that, you know, to remember that all scientific experiments are performed by human beings and the results are subject to human interpretation. And you have to realize that the human mind is essentially a delusion generator, not a window of truth. And while the mind is primed to look for patterns, we're actually really, really bad at looking for it. And of course, this is another idea that will make your brain spin, which is scientists are humans. See, I have no problem with science, but the science is interpreted by scientists who are human beings, who are flawed, and their brains function through a delusion generator system and not a window of truth. Another interesting concept that's talked about in this book is this idea of two movies on one screen. Now, if you look at the elections, a lot of times we're looking at the same screen, same information, right? But we're interpreting it in different ways. And so the old, old man who essentially is this avatar, this godlike figure in this book talks about how human beings are only capable of receiving information and then they create their own advice. So if you seek to influence someone, don't waste your time giving advice. You can only change what people know, not what they do, which is a big aspect of persuasion psychology, which is you can't make people change their behavior. You have to look for ways to channel already existing behavior. The aspect of this book is when this avatar, this uh, old man who seems like God, tells the young character about the ideas around consciousness and awareness. And Scott Adams breaks this down in five different levels. And I'm going to use this uh, image from his recent live stream. If you don't watch it, I highly recommend it. He does it every morning at 7 a.m. Pacific. Really great, very entertaining, and very insightful. And these five levels of, of awareness will really give you an idea of what it means to be conscious. So level number one is consciousness at birth. And consciousness at birth just means that you realize that adults tell the truth. You're told that Santa exists and you believe it. It's pure innocence and just self-awareness. The second level is awareness of others and that others lie. Adults lie. And you essentially start to accept the idea of an authority system, right? And this gives you a belief system. And so you realize that, yeah, maybe Santa isn't real, so adults can lie. The third level of consciousness is realizing that you have awareness that some beliefs may actually not be true. You just don't know which ones. So you go from realizing that adults can lie to realizing that, wait a minute, adults usually rely. They actually lie a lot. I just can't tell which ones are lies and which ones are truth. Now, the fourth level of consciousness, which is probably based on the audience that I, I have, is probably at this level, um, and that is skepticism and an adoption of the scientific method, right? And you can think of this as I'm right and you're wrong, right? That's what most of us are at. That's what the majority of my audience that follows me, they're at the fourth level of consciousness. But now the fifth level. The fifth level is the avatar level, the level that, that this old man in this book has achieved, right? And that is no one is right. So in the fifth level of consciousness, which is this avatar level, you realize that the human mind is a delusion generating machine, right? And all these beliefs, including science, is just another belief system. Albeit that science is just a very effective belief system, but it is a belief system nonetheless. And this is where your brain will start to spin because many people who are going from the fourth level of consciousness to fifth really lean hard on science. And then you realize that science is only a thing that is made up by human beings, interpreted by human beings, and acted on by human beings who are, in a sense, all flawed. Now, let me give you a concept to think about. Why is it that we all have different religions? Wouldn't it just make sense that we would figure out which one is the best religion and then all of us believe the same thing? And that's where this concept of the curious bees comes into play. I'm going to use this wonderful animation uh, created by Lindsay Crasson. I'm going to leave a link to her wonderful website and YouTube page. Go ahead and check it out. And so, Go ahead and buckle up and set your minds blown. And let me tell you about the Curious Bees. Why do people have different religions? I asked. It seems like the best one would win, eventually, and we'd all believe the same thing. The old man paused and rocked. He tucked both hands inside his red plaid blanket. Imagine that a group of curious bees lands on the outside of a church window. 
each bee gazes upon the interior through a different stained glass pane. To one bee, the church's interior is all red. To another, it is all yellow, and so on. The bees cannot experience the inside of the church directly. They can only see it. They can never touch the interior or smell it or interact with it in any way. If bees could talk, they might argue over the color of the interior. Each bee would stick to his version, not capable of understanding that the other bees were looking through different pieces of stained glass. Nor would they understand the purpose of the church or how it got there or anything about it. The brain of a bee is not capable of such things. But these are curious bees. When they don't understand something, they become unsettled and unhappy. In the long run, the bees would have to choose between permanent curiosity, an uncomfortable mental state, and delusion. The bees don't like those choices. They would prefer to know the true color of the church's interior and its purpose. But bee brains are not designed for that level of understanding. They must choose from what is possible, either discomfort or self-deception. The bees that choose discomfort will be unpleasant to be around and they will be ostracized. The bees that choose self-deception will band together to reinforce their vision of a red-based interior, or yellow-based interior, and so on. So what you're saying, we're like dumb bees, I asked, trying to lighten the mood. Worse, we are curious. Now, here's my little spoiler alert for this book. As I read it and tried to look for the flaws, I think the main flaws that I found was this, was that a lot of times the simplest scientific explanation for things is in fact wrong. And the difficult thing to do is to try and look for these simple explanations and challenge them and really pull them apart because it is very convenient for our brains to say, oh, this is so simple, it makes sense, it must be true. When in fact, the mental model that's in our brains when we look at the world, we might have two or three or four different ways of looking at a situation. When in fact, there might be 20 or 30, and of those 20 or 30, there's one that's the best, which we do not possess the ability to interpret, to understand, or even perceive. And so everything in the world often just doesn't make sense, and so we come up with simple solutions, simple explanations for them. But the world is made to make sense. The problem is, is that our brains don't have the model to fit that. So the challenge is to look at these simple explanations, to look at it the way we perceive the world, our beliefs, the way we perceive things, and really challenge it. And of course, this is going to be very painful because you're essentially ripping off the fabric of everything that you know to be true, supposedly true. But in doing this, you will elevate yourself in the level of awareness and consciousness that you have. So that's the book of the week. I absolutely love it. Highly recommend it. Definitely go out and get it. What I recommend is go out, buy the book, and do it with a group of friends and have a discussion about what do you think about the main character? What are the lessons that the old man's trying to, trying to uh, uh, convey here? And maybe do a little uh, discussion over it. Now, selfishly, I do have to recommend be sure to follow Scott, not only on Twitter, but his uh, live Periscope feed, which will be ending in March because Periscope is moving to Twitter, but also his live YouTube channel is really fantastic. He does a show every morning at 7 a.m. He covers uh, real, uh, he covers current events, politics, science, persuasion, a whole lot of things, and of course has a very interesting way of interpreting these things. And you can watch him think through these problems in real time, and he does a very good job of trying to be objective, calling himself out when he's wrong about predictions, when he's right. And you can really learn a lot from him in sense, maybe even get mentored by afar by somebody like him through his live stream. So that's the book of the week. Happy Wisdom Wednesday. And most importantly, Happy New Year. Reflect on the year. 2020 was really hard, but I promise you that 2020 is giving birth to the golden age that's going to be coming in 2021. So bye for now. And as always, I'll see you next week and I'll see you next year. Take care.